Okay, good afternoon, almost good evening. I try to keep people awake and the changing language maybe could be also useful for our foreign colleagues. Actually, the, the idea of the talk uh, I'm going to, to present is just to provide you with uh, a, slight, a short overview on uh, a subject I investigated uh, recently in the past uh, with uh, Professor Tareja and uh, Luca also, Luca Susmala in the last uh, years, uh, and which is the multi-axial free behavioral composites. Actually, the, the, the extensive uh, investigation we did uh, recently, uh, which was published just uh, um, a couple of issues ago uh, with Teresa Jumofadi, was that in this field, uh, in spite of uh, the, the extreme importance it can have uh, on structural design, there are very few models uh, available, actually, there are no suitable models available for, for the design of uh, composite parts under multi action loading. And a couple of, I think, the three or four models you can consider are uh, basically uh, empirical or uh, built for specific conditions like the Smith Pascoe model or even derived from methods. Actually, uh, these are a couple of examples of their analysis of the, some of literature data. For, uh, for instance, applying a typical approach with the polynom uh, polynomial uh, uh, criterion uh, derived from static uh, loading condition and extended to fatigue simply substituting the static strength uh, under the different uh, direction in the fiber material system uh, with the relevant fatigue curves. In, th in this way, you can obtain, you can convert, uh, let's say, a static approach, a static, a static uh, failure criterion to a um, to a fatigue failure criterion. This is uh, the, the extension of the probably most famous uh, criterion for composite, for a uh, UD composite, which is the side field criterion. And uh, you can see in general, if you compare the uh, predicted uh, to the, toward the experimental data, I think the average, the model is not uh, providing uh, a very bad indication. You can have uh, an indication in the range from plus uh, or more or less uh, 400%, which is under fatigue is not that bad. The problem is that uh, for certain series you have a completely bad prediction, and it's really difficult to understand why to explain the reason for this uh, uh, bad, uh, unconservative prediction. The same happened for uh, a uh, model that uh, is developed explicitly for multi-axial loading from uh, Fawas and uh, Fernand Helling which is basically the modification of a reference uh, fatigue line considering the multi-axial loading condition. In this case, you have uh, some very conservative prediction, but at the same time, some very unconservative <coughs> prediction. Even in this case, uh, changing the reference line you consider as a starting point, you can obtain basically whatever you like. And since you don't know a priori which is the correct ref uh, reference line, uh, you never know if you are predicting uh, in conservative or unconservative way. Uh, this is probably the first, uh, the, the only model developed, presented in, liter in literature, developed uh, taking into account, uh, or at least uh, trying to, keep in, to take into account uh, the, the actual fatigue damage, which is the smith pascoe model, which was developed on the basis of the PhD thesis of Pascoe in the 90s, more or less, and uh, tried to keep into account the strain energy density due to normal loading, uh, together with the maximum uh, um, shear uh, stress and obtain uh, this uh, simple, uh, simple uh, relation. Actually, we re uh, readapted the formulation in order to provide a, a easier to use uh, method. And uh, we can see that it's probably the, the, that that provides you with the more uh, reduced uh, variation in the prediction. But even in this case, uh, you have some uh, uh, very bad prediction, which is basically impossible to, 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 to be justified. Another problem, the, the, the data you can find uh, in the literature usually have is uh, that uh, it's really difficult to find clean data. What I mean? Uh, clean, uh, in my view, means that uh, experimental fatigue data where the different uh, stress components are applied without any influence of one component to the other, in the sense that uh, it could be interesting for developing uh, um, a physically based uh, model to have uh, information about the damage <coughs> evolution in very specific conditions, let's say applying a normal stress in transverse direction, and to evaluate, for instance, the influence, the influence of shear in that direction without any contribution of other stress conditions. 
and, uh, and basically the, the layup and the loading condition used in the literature are more oriented to produce uh, general uh, data rather than taking into account uh, okay, still alive, no problem uh, without taking into account this specific aim uh, this is also made quite complicated by the internal uh, uh, multi-axial uh, loading uh, stress state generated by the anisotropic behavior of the materials. So uh, this is the frame where we are working on. And the idea is just to try, and that is the project I, I, I'm introducing now, we are trying to develop an experimental program oriented to characterize specifically the damage evolution in very uh, basic case uh, in order to be able to understand the basic damage mechanism and to use them to develop a uh, model of general validity. Of course, it's a quite long way. This is uh, the starting point uh, after the work we already did in the past, and that is uh, the, the, preliminary, the, the reason because I, quote, I titled the talk just preliminary experience because uh, the, the first data we are obtaining and I would like to share with you this experience. Okay, uh, just a couple of reference conditions. Dealing with uh, composite, uh, you have to consider the, the typical condition associated to the multi axial loading uh, together with the uh, peculiar uh, stress state generated by considering the, the material anisotropic behavior. So it could be useful to define the, the biaxial ratio in terms of material frame of reference. So uh, we can consider the first uh, Bayer-Shalty ratio, where you, you have the ratio between the transverse to normal uh, stress. Uh, the shear bayer ratio, where you have the, the ratio between the, uh, the shear uh, over the normal stress. And also we introduced a new shear uh, bayer ratio, which is uh, concerned with the ratio between the shear component applied to the sample to the normal, uh, sorry, to the transversal normal stress, which is the, uh, a quite, uh, sorry, quite unusual condition, and there are probably only one paper in literature dealing with this, uh, with this specific case. Uh, just to tell you which can be the, the, the main conclusion from the previous work, is uh, I mentioned before that together with Luca and uh, Professor Tareja. The, the main important parameter from, our, the, from the results we had uh, is uh, the, the lambda 2, which is the influence of the shear stress component on the normal stress. And you can see that increasing for the different series, these are, ten, uh, mm, mm, sorry, these are tension torsion uh, tubes, uh, uh, sorry, are uh, composite tubes under tension torsion loading. And you can see that increasing the lambda 2, which means increasing the torsional component, component of the load, uh, you have a decrease of the fatigue strength. And this is a quite uh, common situation we found in many cases in the results we had. And we summarize uh, this behavior using uh, this uh, diagram, which we call uh, multi-axial fatigue ratio diagram, where you can see that uh, if you plot uh, this ratio against uh, the lambda 2 parameter, you have a more or less linear decrease uh, of the fatigue strength the normalized for this right? Okay, just to summarize what we, we, have, we found already is that there is a clear need of a physical based model able to explain why we have some bad prediction in, in certain <coughs> cases. To develop, to, to pass uh, to this uh, situation, we need to know how the material damage under fatigue loading and we also have to consider some primary and secondary mechanisms which are typical of the fatigue loading accounts. Also, we need uh, some uh, clean data, as I um, defined them before, which are uh, data in very specific uh, uh, loading condition, for instance, shear stress over one single normal stress component. Try to speed up a bit because uh, yeah, I'm a bit late. Uh, well, actually, I'm, I have uh, a couple of results I would like to discuss, but what I prefer to stress is the main concept behind the work. And so, uh, dealing with composite and dealing with fatigue of composite, you can uh, consider that the final failure is always related to fibers, which are the, the strongest part of the material. But in this case, you can define some primary damage mechanisms. At the same time, you have other mechanisms which are typically matrix cracking, the lamination, uh, bonding within fiber and matrix, which can be probably not very important when you are dealing with static failure, but uh, they can 
enhance dramatically the evolution of the primary mechanism when you are dealing with fatigue. And so we decide to start uh, from this part uh, and start to consider the, the, the study of the, the um, what we call other mechanism and to evaluate in the second part of the project uh, the very influence of the primary mechanism. Okay, try to, to be quick. When you test composite, you have uh, basically two op main options. Cruciform samples and tubular. When you do tests on uh, cruciform specimen, you have basically no option to apply it from the external side, shear. So basically you can only deal with the, the lambda 1 parameter, which is the ratio between the sigma 2 to sigma 1. Otherwise, when you consider tubular sample, you can uh, play also with the layup, and if you have a zero degree oriented fiber, you can never obtain uh, uh, sigma 2, which is transversal stresses. And so you have always lambda 1 equal to 0, and uh, also lambda, sorry, there is one error mistake here, is lambda 1, 2 equal to 0, because you have no, no sigma 2. So you can move, pass from lambda 2 equal to 0 to uh, lambda 2 different from 0 when you apply pure tension or tension and torsion. At the same time, if you change the fiber orientation to 90 degree, you can take out completely the sigma 1, which is the normal stress, and you can play also with sigma 2 and sigma 6. And so you can uh, uh, change the, the value of the lambda 1, 2 parameter. We decide to start, as I said, from this configuration, and uh, we start to face some uh, trouble in preparing sample, which is not that easy when you only wrap 90 degree UV fibers. You have to avoid pores, uh, and you have also to avoid some uh, uh, ply misalignment. Uh, there are some trouble also in uh, developing uh, the, the final tab uh, to prevent failure due to grip, because if you wrap the material directly in the molding phase, we have some undercuts, uh, which make the sample fail in there. S skipping this part, okay, we try also to machine the sample, but you can also induce damage on the surface. So, even making the sample is not a very easy task. We decide to start from cylindrical sample and to uh, use uh, this uh, clamping system in the machine or even to clamp directly the, the tube in the machine grip using an inside uh, steel cylinder to prevent buckling. Okay, the one of the tricky stories that to obtain failure in the central part of the sample. These are some results we obtain uh, uh, starting from pure tension on the transversal loading uh, and increasing progressively the, the, the applied torsion component. And uh, you see that even in this case, uh, as long as the uh, torque applied to the sample, or if you prefer the shear stress increase, uh, you have the dramatic decrease of the, 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 um, the fatigue strain, which is still confirming that shear plays also a very, plays also a very important role even when you are dealing with the, what we call other mechanisms, which are the secondary fatigue mechanisms. Mm. Uh, starting from the, uh, the results we got, uh, we are more interested in the damage evolution rather than, one minute, Luca, sorry, uh, is for those who don't see what he did, he just asked me to cut, yes, I'm, I'm over. Uh, basically, in this case, it's really difficult to, to investigate the damage evolution because we have a, a, basically a sudden failure due to the specific configuration. We have the, the growth of a single crack, which is usually in mode 2 or mode 3, and then a propagation all along the, the sample, which is therefore difficult to identify some stiffness change in the sample or even a, a stable crack propagation. We use uh, infrared thermography um, uh, using locking procedure, we use internal light investigation but we, wasn't, we are not able to find any indication of, the fate of um, a stable growth of the mechanism. Okay, concluding the results is uh, already uh, uh, explained. I simply want to tell you that the evolution of the project is just to investigate further this situation and to investigate also the, sorry, the, the <coughs> fatigue behavior in the presence of constant uh, shear stress uh, and uh, following with the project, change layup to zero degree in the tubes uh, or even um, angle ply tubes uh, in other conditions. I hope to be able to give you some further results in the next uh, occasion we have to meet. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.